Hello, my name is Andrew Cotton. I'm an English teacher from Birmingham, Alabama. This recording features an interview of Jeffrey McKenna, author of Saving Dr. Warren, A True Patriot, given by my students, eighth grade English class from Mountain Brook Junior High. Please forgive the clickety clacking of the keys as I was taking notes and cross-referencing information mentioned in the interview to add to the comments section of our Google Meet. Should have done a better job of moving the microphone, alas. Without further ado, here's our interview of Jeffrey McKenna from December 2020. Hope you enjoy. Thank you all for being here, all these students and, and fellow educators, and it's my pleasure to introduce Jeff McKenna, author of Saving Dr. Warren, A True Patriot. Jeffrey is an attorney by day, but a writer by night, and Saving Dr. Warren, A True Patriot is his first novel. And if this book is any indication of what's ahead in his writing career, it certainly won't be his last. He's a friend of this class. He generously donated 125 copies of the book to us. He sacrificed many minutes and sometimes hours putting up with me and my emails, and he's become a dear friend to me. Ladies and gentlemen, Mr. McKenna. Well, Andrew, I thank you. I can't tell you, you guys, you know, as I was thinking about uh, this meeting, and again, I'm looking at all of these names and I, and I recognize them. I recognize them from reading reviews and and uh, Mary, there might be other Mary that are part of the group, but uh, I was just sharing with my daughter what a neat review you had uh, 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 posted. And uh, and I just thought to myself, as I thought about this meeting, I thought, you guys are like the founding fathers, right? You're like the founding fathers of the Saving uh, Dr. Warren, a True Patriot book. Because really, you know, you guys thought when you guys were posting your uh, Google Reads, you were some of the first ones to be posting. And I read them last night, and I read them uh, this morning, and I just thought, thank you. I mean, that's what I have to say to you is, is thank you. I, uh, I appreciate having uh, people like you that are creating this hopeful, you know, hopefully all of us, right, you know, this excitement about somebody that was forgotten. And you're helping to make that happen. And so I just thank you guys so much. I I've told uh, Mr. Cotton on a number of occasions that uh, if there's any way that this coronavirus lifts and a, a possibility of being able to do an in-person visit, there would be nothing I would love more than to be able to spend some time with Mr. Cotton. He and I both share just a love of, uh, of this time period and of writing. I don't know if you guys know this, but Mr. Cotton is an amazing writer in his own right. I've had the chance to review some of uh, what he has done, and um, you know, just fun to get together with somebody that has this same love of writing and uh, of our founding fathers. And, and most importantly, in addition to getting to hang out with him there in Birmingham, I would get to come and I would get to see you guys, uh, this, this first group of students that have really used the book in its final product. There was a there was a group that I dedicated the book to. You guys, if you have hard copies of the book and maybe some of the digital too still have it and still a middle school class. They were eighth graders. They were a history class that provided a lot of help and a lot of insight. But they were the first to actually have the book, the real book, the whole book. That's your guys' class. So I consider, you know, all of these names that I look at here, you know, Jenny and Addie and Payne and Caroline, you know, you guys are the founding fathers of the of the book. And I just thank you a bunch for, for helping uh, spread the word that there was this patriot named uh, Joseph Warren, and he did a whole bunch for our country. And we can read a fun book about him, and we can remember him. So my thanks go to all you guys. Well, thank you very much, um, Jeff. We've been um, enthralled with your work and, and we've dug in and we've read the book and we've, we've had a chance to, to write a lot about it, think about it and talk about it. And hopefully um, students will remember this for a long time. And I think they're going to remember 
the experience, but they're going to remember the message. And that, that comes from you. So thank you. I've spoken to some students who have some questions uh, and they are very eager to ask them and think all of us would benefit from hearing the answers. I know that uh, Jeff has some questions for us. So I think for the first part, I'm going to call on students to ask a question and then um, Mr. McKenna will respond and then we'll move to the next question and, and I'll kind of keep track of time. If we haven't already covered it, we'll move to Mr. McKenna's questions and then we'll open the floor to any other ones we might have. I'll start the uh, conversation at, by asking Virginia Scott to ask her question. Mr. McKenna, why did you write Saving Dr. Warren, A True Patriot? Well, I think the answer to that is that uh, 20 years ago, my wife, my beautiful wife, gave me a book. And it was either for my birthday or Christmas. I can't remember. My birthday is in December and Christmas is in December. But I remember reading that book. And it was in uh, probably the early spring of 2001. And that first chapter in the book, it was called Rebels and Redcoats, and it was written in the 1950s. And it talked about those that had participated in the Revolutionary War of Virginia. And, and I'd always enjoyed um, history. You know, I'm one of those guys that, you know, liked history. I, I wasn't a history major in college, but I always enjoyed it. And in the first chapter, it's talking about Paul Revere, but he was talking about how Paul Revere was thinking through the, the, the streets of Boston at night, and he was trying to get to this house, and he was watching to make sure the Redcoats red coats weren't following him. And he goes inside the house, and he gets the order on this, on this famous ride that he's going to do. And I'm thinking to myself, wow, I didn't know anybody gave Paul Revere orders. Who's this guy that's telling Paul Revere what to do? And you and I know, all of you readers now know, most Americans don't know, but you guys know, that person was Dr. Joseph Warren. And once I learned about him, I wanted to learn more about him. And the more I learned about him, the more I thought, wow, I'd love to tell this guy's story. And I didn't know how to do it, uh, Virginia, but then all of a sudden 9-11 came. You know, three or, you know, about, I guess, maybe seven, eight, nine months later, 9-11 hit. And I was a young father, and I just thought to myself, you know what? I want to tell a story for kids. I want to talk about 9-11. I want it to be about Joseph Warren. And then I'm an estate planning attorney. I dealt with a lot of World War II veterans because in the early 2000s, they were in their 70s. And, and so they came in, and I would do wills for them, and I would do trust. So that's the kind of attorney I am, and I loved them. I loved the kind of people they were. And I thought, I want to tell their story too. So that's how Saving Dr. Warren and True Patriot came about. We have 9-11, and I had a 14-year-old because I wanted to be about kids because I was a father and I wanted something for my kids to be able to enjoy. We had World War II because I had all these World War II veterans that I just loved. And then we have, you know, Dr. Uh, Joseph Warren, who was the one that had made me have this inspiration to want to write something about my country. And and so that's it, Virginia. I, I wanted to write something about my country and, and, and those three periods of my country. And, and that's the book we ended up with. Thank you for sharing that, Jeff. I want to hand it over to one of my favorite teachers that I've ever worked with. Her name is Jenny Bakken, and she teaches at the high school. Her son, Jack, was the one who actually brought the musket ball to class. They're just an incredible family of historians, and I'd say the same is true of Jack, though he might not know it yet. But uh, Jenny has a question. Hi, Mr. McKenna. Um, thanks for, for letting me join you in uh, Mr. Khan's class. I appreciate it. I'd like to hear a little bit about your research process um, in writing this book. Well, it starts like with what uh, Mr. Cotton said, Jenny. You know, I, I, I was never like a huge historian. Um, but I was exposed to Dr. Warren through that Rebels and Red Coast book, which you'll find there's a number of different titles, um, uh, Mr. Cotton, that have that title. It's the 1950s version. I can't remember the authors now. But uh, going back to um, Jenny's question, so I, I first get exposed to him, and so it's all on the computer. Every All my research about Dr. Warren is on the computer. And then, Jenny, I had a major breakthrough in 2012. In 2012, I had gotten Jenny all of the biographies. There's not a lot of biographies on Joseph Warren, 
In fact, oh, this is fun to share with everybody here. Um, so all of you guys that have read the book, Kane and Caroline and 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 um, Gerard, all, all Elizabeth, all of you that have read the book know that one of the characters is a man by the name of Mr. Frothingham. Well, Guinea, one of the major biographers of Joseph Warren was a man by the name of Richard Frothingham. And he wrote the definitive biography on Joseph Warren in eight in the 1870s. I want to say it was published in like 1873. And initially, to get a hold of a Frothingham book, they were really expensive because they're these really old books. But then they republished it, and they made it easy to get. Now, I've, I've also got an old Frothingham book just to kind of have as a collector's item, but I got the republished one. You know, that was like 20 bucks, and I just marked that thing up like crazy. There was a 1960s biography that was done by um, by a writer in Illinois. His name is escaping me. Oh, Perry. John Perry was the last name. Not a very good one, though. I didn't use that one as much. The Frothing Ham was really helpful. But here, Jimmy was the big thing. I've been following. I knew what was out there on Joseph Warren. I had researched everything I could find. And then all of a sudden on Amazon, there popped up in 2012, there popped up a new biography by a, a, by a um, Samuel Foreman, Dr. Samuel Foreman. And I got on the waiting list. I wanted to get that biography right away. And as soon as it came up, I just devoured it. Well, Sam Foreman became a friend. I reached out, I contacted him, and we actually brought him to Southern Utah. He is a he's a Harvard um, faculty member. He's a physician that loves history, and he just dived into Dr. Warren. And so I brought him out, and he spoke at a veteran's home here in Southern Utah, and he stayed at my house for a couple days. And so, Jimmy, I felt like I got the best. I, I was tutored by the leading authority on Joseph Warren that walked the planet. He could talk about 1770s Boston better than I could talk about my 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 current neighborhood. He knew the, the people and where they lived better than I knew where people lived in my own little community. So anyways, um, uh, that, that became my source. And then I made a number of trips back to Boston. I was there when they did the dedication of uh, Dr. Warren's um, graveside, uh, I think it was four years ago, and I got to meet tons and tons of people that love Dr. Warren. One of them, for all you guys that are kind of looking, if you, if you go to the book reviews on Amazon, there is a um, Hamilton Eustis. That might be a name that you're kind of thinking about. William Eustis. He's actually a descendant of William Eustace, one of the characters in the book, who truly was one of Dr. Warren's apprentices. And she loved Dr. Warren. I met her when I went back uh, and visited with Sam Foreman and these other um, people that loved Joseph Warren during that um, dedication of the grave, of the um, statue on his graveside. But um, she read the book and did an amazing review. But just meeting those people, Jenny, was super, super helpful. These were people that knew the most about Joseph Warren and, uh, as anybody on the planet. And I, you know, I made a couple trips back to, to Boston, visited with them, but, but mostly it was just on the internet, reading every and all books that I could get about him and then just coming up with, uh, with a story that wouldn't just be about history and it wouldn't just be about Joseph Warren, but it would be a story that, you know, guys like, you know, all of these eighth graders, you know, uh, Ralph and uh, Sophia and, and Kylie and Travis and all of them would actually enjoy. Because whenever there was a choice, whenever my daughter and I, she was my, my editor. My, I had three professional editors that I paid, but my daughter was my best. She's an eighth grade history teacher. And whenever there was a choice, guys, as to whether or not Max or Olivia, I would keep a part in Malcolm that might talk more about history. But if it took away from the, uh, the, the flow of the novel, the excitement of the novel, my daughter, the eighth grade history teacher, would say, cut it, Dad, cut it, Dad, cut it, Dad. And I hated cutting, but I would listen to her because I wanted more than in, more than history, more than anything else. I wanted the reader to just enjoy it, to just have fun with it. So your comments when you guys say stuff like that, like, oh, I wasn't really much of a history reader, but man, I liked this. Or I thought this was going to be boring, but, but it wasn't. It was actually exciting. 
it almost makes me cry, guys. It almost makes me cry. So thank you for all those kind words. That was a really long explanation, Jenny, but that's that's what I did to do my research for uh, Joseph, learning about Joseph Warren. I appreciate you sharing that. I've, I've updated both those books in the chat for anybody that's interested in extending their uh, learning about Dr. Warren. I'm going to ask Payne to ask his question, but Payne, I want you to to lean into the, the writing and editing piece because he's addressed the research, okay? I would just like to start out by saying, you were talking about this a little bit earlier. I just wanted to start out about saying how much I like this book. This book seemed, uh, I'm not a history person at all, but this book I actually really enjoyed. So to get into my question, I would like to know uh, a little bit more about uh, like what you were thinking about as you were writing this book. Well, that's a good question, Payne. Um, most of the time, I was just thinking about this is thinking hard. This is hard. I'm going to be honest. Like, I've read Mr. Cotton's stuff. I I've read his, he can write. Mr. Cotton can write. I struggled, um, Payne, so much. Um, the first time I submitted my, uh, my manuscript to somebody that was kind of a professional writer, she was a friend of a friend of a sister kind of thing, and she was like a professional writer out of New York. And she was heading on a trip, and I and I got her really excited about my book because I could really talk it up. But she read it, Penny, and you know what she did? She only read like four or five chapters, and then she basically said, "You know what, Jeff, this McKenna guy, you know what? You need to learn to write." And she suggested some books on writing for me to read, and it was really discouraging, Payne. You know, I spent a lot of time, and but I recognized my problem was like I knew where to put commas. I knew, you know, how to make a, a you know, a complete sentence. I, I, you know, I went to law school. I went four years of college and three years of law school. But if I write a book like I write my trust or I write my law contract, you know how exciting pain that book is? It's not very exciting. And so when I was writing, you know, your question was, what was I thinking? I was thinking this is hard. How do I make this exciting? How can I, how can I write so that I really like, you know, some of you guys, again, where I just want to almost cry, it's like some of you guys would say, man, as I was reading this, I felt like I was there. I felt like I was, you know, actually traveling in time, or I was actually there at Bunker Hill in the battle. When you guys say something like that, you don't know, like, how meaningful that is to me, because that wasn't easy at all for me to be able to do. And so when you say something like that, I just been like, yes. It got there, you know, 20 years of working on this. It got there. It got to be what I hoped it would be. So I don't know, Payne, if that answers, you know, the question, but most of the time, honestly, I was just thinking it's hard. It's hard to, to paint the picture. I, I say that in my introduction. I had to spend 20 years learning how to paint with words a story so that you see the story you feel the story, and you're part of that. And even now, as I write, I'm, I'm better at that pain, and I'm hoping that my next book doesn't take me 20 years because I'm getting old. But um, but it's still it's still really hard for me to to do it. That sets up the next question perfectly. So, Miss Wilbanks, why don't you tell Mr. McKenna a little bit about uh, what we did before my students read this book and what, what I uh, asked of you and, and what you graciously were willing to do and then head into your question. I'm Sharon and I'm in ninth grade, so I had Mr. Cotton last year, but my locker is conveniently right next to his classroom, so he was able to ask me if I'd be willing to read the book a little bit before. Um, I'm not sure how much um, farther ahead of the eighth grade class, but to read the book as well. And um, I was willing to do that because I do enjoy reading historical fiction. I'll jump in and say she's selling herself short. I I put a lot of faith and trust in her and, and, and with the hard question of, I knew I loved this book, Jeff, and, and you know why I love this book. I think you accomplished a lot in a, in a little space. I think that you captured a sentiment of what it's like to be in middle school that's really hard to do as an adult. But I love this book mostly because we share an appreciation of the time period and the content. So I needed an outside source. 
who was this age who could tell me, is this book good or not? Or do I have blinders on? And um, she's busy. She's a ninth grader. GPA matters and all these things. And she had every reason to say, no, I can't read this book for you. And she went and bought it herself. Didn't even give her a copy. And she read it and gave me great feedback on what's working and whether kids would enjoy it. So um, thank you for that, Sherrod. But uh, that leads me to your question. Go ahead. The question was, is there anything you could tell us about the sequel to the book? Well, first, before I say anything out there, I just say, thank you. It would have never happened but for you. And you kind of told Mr. Cotton that you liked this book. I wouldn't have the chance to be, you know, talking to all of you great students. And Jared, and I'll start with you, man. You are really the that that impetus of getting all these founding fathers here for the book. So thank you, Sherrod, for that. And as far as book two, boy, I'd love to have you be a sounding board, you and the, Mr. Cotton and any of your eighth grade colleagues too to help me on it. There's gonna be a lot of exciting parts in book two in the context of getting to know more about that. Um, you know, the society and learning more about time traveling palace math. And you know what? You 30 guys that are on this are going to hear a secret that nobody else gets. You get kind of a spoiler. But we talked about Frothingham. Frothingham, we're going to find out, um, he's going to pop up in some early American, he's going to pop up in a photo, some of the early, early periods of photography. Frothingham knows everything, right? That's what we learned in, in book one. But Frothingham lets himself make a mistake, and he gets in a photo that's like an 1830s, 1840s photo. How does Frothingham get in an 1830s, 1840s photo? We're going to learn that Frothingham has went by different names at different times in history. We're going to find out within the society, there's certain people that are really, really special. And Frothingham is one of them. And so there's going to be some interesting things that will come up. I cannot lose my characters. I love my characters, uh, Jared. So, 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 of course, um, Curtis will be involved. Steve will be totally involved. Rob will be totally involved in my favorite character. Without doubt, my favorite with a capital F, Grace. Grace will be involved. She's always the smartest of the group. And she'll be the one that will be on. She'll be solving some of these hidden mysteries about the society. The second book talks about family, and it's going to be about Curtis. You guys read that first chapter of book two, where what's the main thing in the in the first phrases of the book? I don't care. I don't care. Not my the family was mad. My parents are mad at me. I don't care. I got in a terrible fight. I don't care. I'm going to be a great football player. That's all I care about. And I want him to realize, you know what? You should care because they your your posterity. The generations behind, so that's where his time travel is going to be, is to experience what it was like, you know, in the Civil War, what it was like during the era where, you know, you had a lot of rough things, and, and how his family was able to pull together and pull out. And Curtis is African American. And so I really wanted to make sure that I do a, a proper job in the context of doing this. Well, I know I'm, I'm excited about book two and we've talked about it and I know it's, um, I know it's important to you to tell this story. I don't think it's going to take you 20 years to write this book. And, and that's exciting for us, um, because we'll get a chance to, to read it much sooner. I want to hand the mic over to Emily. Alrighty. So, uh, Mr. McKenna, could you tell us what it was like to work with your daughter and her class? Okay, that's a fun question to answer. Well, let me tell you, Emily, first about my daughter. This is the funniest story. So, so I, uh, my daughter and I, we've always done a lot together. We, I coached her in soccer, and she's a great, she was a great soccer player growing up. And she, her and her friends won a state championship her senior year, which is so fun, so cool. And she went on to be a history teacher. But this is a funny thing, Emily. I worked on this book for 20 years. My daughter is 26. She just turned 26. But the funny thing is, is I could not get her to read the book, Emily. I would say in the manuscript. It was just the manuscript. I'd say, Megan, Megan, you know what you read? No, Dad, I outdid that. Not, but she would never read it. So finally, she was getting ready, Emily, to teach as a, um, a student intern 
and she was going to get her own class, and it was an eighth grade history class, and she'd been reading books in the library, you know, Change, My Brother Sam is Dead, some of the other historical fiction books of that time period, Donnie Tremaine, and she, she's like, okay, Dad, you know, maybe I'll give your manuscript a try. So she read the manuscript, and Emily, this was one of the highlights, like winning the state championship was awesome, watching her do that, but I'll tell you one of the highlights, Emily, was when she came to me after reading the manuscript, and, and her words were something like this. Dad, it's pretty good. I think I'd like to use this in my eighth grade class for you know teaching American U.S. history. Emily, I'm just about, like my heart just was about to explode. I was just so happy. And so she, I wasn't all the way done with the with my final rewrite. In fact, I had all of part five left to do, the whole remembering section. And she was like, you've got to get it done, Dad. And if I start this, you've got to promise me you'll get this done by the end of on the, on the Revolutionary War. And so you have to have it done by like December. And I'm like, I'm on it, hon. I, I can do it. You use this book for those eighth graders. I'll, I'll spend all the manuscripts. So I, I had to spend a ton of money and go to Kiko's and get all these manuscripts. But they had all these manuscripts that he took up, and uh, they were in northern Utah, uh, and and they did it. And and she would say, Dad, you know, there's some suggestions here and some suggestions there. And, and she definitely made the book better, and those students definitely made the book better. But the cool thing, Emily, is that they liked it, that they were saying, yeah, this is kind of a fun way to learn history. Yeah. And she would read it out loud to them, Emily. So, so they got to a point at first, Emily, she was reading it to them, and they'd be like, oh, teacher, oh, really? Lit? And then at about day three, that stopped, no more complaining. And then at about day 10, she was able to say, hey, hey, if you guys aren't quiet, hey, if you guys aren't getting your work done, we're not going to read today. They'd be quiet. Boom. They'd start getting their work done because they didn't want to miss out on hearing more of the, of the book. And when she was sharing that with me, it just, it just, it just drove me. Like, I, like uh, Mr. Cotton said, I'm a lawyer during the day, and I'm an author at night. And I'm not only an author at night, um, Andrew, but I'm also an author, Emily, early, early in the morning. I was getting up at like, you know, 4.30, 5 o'clock in the morning so that I'd have time to write before I'd have to go into work because I wanted to have it done. I wanted part five done. So that she'd be able to have that for her students, but but that's how it all happened. Is she finally finally read the book when she was going to be a U.S. history teacher, and she thought, "Wow, this might have something here that I could use." I made the copies of the manuscript, and uh, and she used it for that eighth grade um, for her eighth grade history students. And there were a lot of them, kind of like you guys. There were multiple classes, so there were like a hundred of them, and uh, and they gave me input and they gave me feedback. Um, I'll just say this. This is an interesting thing because um, Mr. Cotton and I have talked about this within his book. One of the things, Emily, that I had in the first versions of my book that these students read, these eighth grade history students, just like you guys, except they were history, um, I had swear words. There were some swear words in my book um, at different points. Rob swore. Um, i trying to remember who else I had swear. I, it might have been the British soldier. Um, there were a couple places where I had swear words that I felt like were important. Dr. Noel, I thought that they were. And uh, the kids came back saying, why do you do the swear words? And I thought, you know what? We'll figure out a way to not. And and uh, you know who was my kind of a guide and help on that was J.K. Rowling. I'm sure you guys have heard of J.K. Rowling. But in her beginning books of the Harry Potter series, she would say stuff, and this is what I learned when I researched how to like, how to have swearing without swearing. And J.K. Rowling would say in the book, you know, that Harry swore or, you know, something. He wouldn't, he wouldn't use the swear words. He would just say they swore. And so I was able to kind of fix a few things and, and kind of change the book. So there's no swearing now in the book. And I don't intend to have any swearing in book two or book three. And I'm going to share this with you right now. Writing is really, really hard for me. I have three books in me. And then after that, I'm passing the baton. But the books are, it's going to be about, the first one was, of course, about Steve and, and, and patriotism. The second one will be about Curtis and about family. And, and the third one will be about grace. And it'll be about this, uh, this Jewish girl with a very Christian name. 
that will also have experiences with uh, some, some Muslims. And it'll be some very dark. Um, Grace will have the darkest of times and she'll have the brightest of times. And they will be right there side by side, next to each other. The absolute brightest of bright, the absolute darkest of dark, um, as she's experiencing her uh, time traveling experiences. She will be older. Um, there will be a number of years that pass, just like J.K. Rowling's theory. Um, there will be a number of years that pass, and, and she'll be a high schooler uh, when when she has her time traveling experiences. But anyway, that's uh, th there's some uh, there's some of the thoughts with respect to how my daughter came into it. It's heartwarming to me as the father of two daughters, both very young, that um, that my future career in writing could possibly involve them is just one of the sweetest prospects. And so I admire you and um, I, I envy that. So um, that's wonderful. So I have three more questions. Caroline, why don't you go ahead and ask your question? What are you hoping readers get out of the book? Um, the first and the second. Thanks, Caroline. That's a great question. And I would, uh, first look for sure, you know, there's a tagline that uh, we, we created a, a charity, Caroline. It's uh, my office. I'm a, I'm a law office, so we were able to create a charity. He helped create the website, and we created a charity called Help Patriotism Prevail. And, you know, many of my clients, Caroline, have donated money so that we can get books for free, like we were able to do with Mr. Cotton's class. In fact, we there's not, Caroline, I don't want one single teacher, one single school in this country to ever have to, you know, pay for those books. If they want to use the books, we want to have the books for them so that they have them, and we want the lesson plans. And every one of you, when you see Mr. Cotton, give him a high five from me or a knuckle to say, this is for Mr. McKenna, this is for Mr. McKenna, this is for Mr. McKenna. And the reason why I want you, Elizabeth and Charles and, and Brooke to do that and Jane and Don to do that is because Mr. Cotton prepared the best, Caroline, lesson plans ever. My daughter did great lesson plans for U.S. history teachers, but Mr. Cotton did them for language art teachers because you guys were a language art class, and his lesson plans are phenomenal, and they're all posted on our website, and they're all free. So going back to your question, Caroline, I want every teacher across this country to be able to get free books, Three lesson plans, and if they want, I'm happy to, on my own expense, travel to whether it be Birmingham, whether it be Seattle, whether it be Boston, whether it be New York City or Miami, Florida. I will travel there on my own dime, on my own expense, so that I can speak to them and help motivate them about what, Caroline? Patriotism. When they finish the book, Saving Dr. Warren, a true patriot. I want them to feel more patriotism for their country. Because Dr. Warren, 34 years old, I'm 20 years older than that. He would have been dead for 20 years. He did so much at age 34. 34 was when I first learned about him. 34 was when I first started writing about him. And it took me 20 years just to write a book about him. He did so much. At age 34, when he died, for this country. So, you ask, what do I want somebody to get out of the book? I want them to love this country more. Does our country have faults, Caroline? Yeah, that's what kind of book two is going to talk a little bit about. But it's the greatest country on this planet. It is. It is, and it is. But we can be better. And book two is going to help us see some of the ways we can be better. I hope it'll be just as fun to read as book one. I hope when kids get done with book two, they'll be just like you guys saying, you know what, man, I thought this book was going to be boring, but you know what? I actually like this. It's kind of cool. It's kind of fun and exciting. Book two, Caroline, I want people to appreciate, again, a great country, and I want us to understand how we can be better and how we can help families to be better. Um, that's what I really want in book two. But I want to have fun doing it. We'll do it with Curtis. We'll do it with Rob. We'll do it with Steve. We'll do it with Grace. And we're going to do it, learning more about that society that houses these talismans and, uh, and that chain penny. That's a cool penny. 
the real penny and slaves did used to carry those cane pennies because it was it was kind of um uh oxymoron it would say which you know it was it was uh it, it had liberty on one side and it had chains on the other side and you know if you were an african-american that was a slave you craved liberty but you found chains and so they they would keep those pennies you know an african-american would keep those pennies and so that's uh, that's going to be Curtis's time traveling palace man. That's going to zap him all over the place. He's not going to just be in one spot like Steve. He's not going to just be with one person in history. He's going to get bounced around a little bit and have some different experiences with his family members. He's going to be going back and he's going to learn that he's visiting family members that are having different experiences. And hopefully, by the end of his time traveling experiences, and hopefully our readers, all of us, by the time we get done with book two. We will, uh, we'll have a greater appreciation for family and for our ancestors that have done so much for us to have what we have now. Travis, if you'll mm-hmm. go ahead and ask your question. So what's one detail from that time period, born related or not, that you really want to put into the book, but you can't read or you couldn't make room for? Oh, well, that's a really good question. Give me just a second to think on that, Travis. So if I, understand you're saying what did I like what kind of got cut out that was something from that time period that uh that I wanted okay this I don't know that this is the best but it's the one that kind of comes to mind um in an early edition of the book dentists our uh, doctors were also dentists and so I had a scene in the book where um a guy was getting a tooth pulled by uh, Dr. Warren and uh and they were they were talking about things at that period I mean that's probably not the best, but it's the only one I can think of, Travis, right now. It got cut. Um, my daughter said, no, Dad, that's not going to work. Or I, somebody cut it. At one point, it wasn't my daughter, it was somebody else. So that scene got uh, that got put on the trash. The doctors used to pull teeth. They weren't dentists. The doctor did everything. So I had Dr. Warren pulling teeth, and I kind of thought that was kind of a fun fact. You know, doctors were like dentists back then. And, you know, hopefully Paul Revere was watching so that he could learn, you know, how to put together that specific arrangement of teeth that ended up in Dr. Warren's head that was able to, uh, they were able to identify him from. I hope you guys all know that what Mr. Cotton just said is, is a true fact, you know, that that really was uh, the first case of uh, forensic dentistry in the, in the United States. And and I, I'd like to think, uh, Mr. Cotton, that maybe uh, Paul Revere and Joseph Warren were buddies. The last question is a little self-serving. Uh, Jeff, you'll probably notice that from the content of the question. Go ahead, Jane. First of all, I, I really love the book. Um, I really like historical, historical fiction, so um, I really loved it. Um, my question is, do you have any advice for aspiring writers? And I love writing, so this, this is... Uh, Definitely, like, this would be helpful for me. I want to encourage you. Writing is a wonderful thing, James. If you enjoy doing it, go on and keep doing it. You know, English degrees in college are wonderful degrees, you know, to, to be able to do things with. Everybody in their office, like, I mean, we hire paralegals, and you always want a good writer. If you want to go on to law school, there's no better undergraduate degree than English because you learn to write, and then you can write in your in your law classes or whatever it may be, you go on to get an MBA, a master's in business administration, just having a good English degree. So if you love writing, I say lean into it, as Mr. Cotton would say, lean into it. And and the more you write, the better you'll get. And um, and I, I'll share a book with you, and I shared this with my daughter students um, when I met with them. Uh, it's Stephen King's book. Like, I don't like Stephen King's stuff. Like, I don't like... Uh, um, you know, gore and horror and all that stuff. But Stephen King wrote a book on writing. I think it's called Stephen King on Writing. I've read that book at least a half a dozen times, okay? and I'll read it again before I really get deep into my book too. Um, I love how he teaches about writing, and I would really, really recommend that to you. Um, but but just keep doing what you're doing, writing a lot and enjoy it. Um, I wish I enjoyed it. I, I do enjoy it. I don't want to act like I don't enjoy it because I do. It's just it's harder for me, I think, than some people. Uh, but it gets easier the more I've done it. And and truly, I can write now a lot easier than I could, you know, 15, 20 years ago or 10 years ago, even, you know, putting together stories. So do it a lot and uh, 
and, and that would be my recommendation. But but do it, James, because you guys are really a neat group and you've got a lot of talent. I, I second that statement. So thank you for sharing that, Jeff. Now, um, Jeff, if you have any questions, now would be a good time. Um, and, and, you know, maybe we covered it all. That was a very in-depth interview, and, and I appreciate that, all of you students and you, Jeff. But if there's anything you had questions about, we're more than happy to, to, to address them or spitball or whatever you'd like. Hey, thanks, uh, Andrew. I sure have loved this hour. Uh, best hour of my day, I can guarantee you, getting to talk to you guys. Um, but, um, you know, I, uh, if we had our video, I would, show, I, I had intended to just kind of show you some things. Um, you would have looked and you would have seen three of these, like, um, gray kind of marble looking things, and you would have easily spotted them and you would have said, ah, oh, McKenna, Mr. McKenna, Jeff. Oh, they're musket balls, and they are. They're musket balls from the 1770s. I've shown you those. And then I showed you another thing, and it would have been this like gold, uh, gold button about the size of these little round icons that I'm looking at on my computer screen that represent each of you. But it would have been made of like gold looking. Anybody? I'm going to ask this a question. I want somebody to raise their hand and unmute themselves. What do you think that might have been? Round, the size of uh, your buttons that I'm looking at here that are your icons made out of gold. Sila? Is it the brass button? Yeah, Silo. Well done. And Silo, actually, I wrote something down about Silo. I said, Silo said, Grace is a ray of sunshine in her Goodreads review. When I was reading that last night during my office late at night, I read your Silo and I liked it so much, I wrote it down. And I thought, if I see Silo tomorrow, I'm going to tell her that I just loved that quote. Grace? is a ray of sunshine. So that's how I feel about Greg. So you really struck a chord with me on that one, Silas, or Sila, but you are exactly right. You would have been seeing a, it's, uh, it's I, I bought a revolutionary, off of eBay, I bought a revolutionary war uh, button. I want to put each of you in charge of sharing the message of, the, of Dr. Warren to anybody and everybody you can share it with. Help them now start thinking about our 250th anniversary. Like Mr. Cotton said, the Boston Massacre 250th, 250th anniversary already came and went. It's past us. But not the Boston Tea Party, not the Battle of Bunker Hill, not all these other things that Joseph Warren was involved in. When he sent Paul Revere on that midnight ride, you know, uh, in 1775, and 2025, we'll be celebrating the 250th anniversary of it. Let's not forget Joseph Warren with the guy that sent Paul Revere on the ride. Joseph Warren was the guy that coordinated it all. Paul Revere was awesome. I love Paul Revere. But Joseph Warren, he was the guy. If you told Paul Revere 250 years ago, you're going to be more famous than Dr. Warren, your buddy, he would have laughed at you. You would have laughed and said, no way, I'll never be more famous than Joseph Warren. So I put all of you guys in charge of being the, the, the guys that spread the word to say, hey, our 250th anniversary is coming. And guess what? This book talks about the guy that really laid the foundation for it all. No, he didn't sign the Declaration of Independence on July 4th, 1776, because he was dead because he signed it with his blood. Thank you for sharing that, Jeff. I'll open the floor now for anyone that has anything. I just wanted to say like, thank you for like putting your time and energy into meeting with us and letting us read your book. It was, it was really, um, it was really cool to learn about Dr. Warren and like the, all the American revolution and putting it in perspective from like a middle schooler. It was really cool how you did that. Kylie, I want to thank you I guys so much for for uh, those kind words and uh, and being here on this uh, this this uh, conference. Agreed. Yeah. Well, thank you all. I mean, that's what a great way to end this. Um, such kind words from both of you, and um, what a powerful experience this has been. So informative, and thank you for your time, Jeff. Thank you, students. I know that ever since exams were canceled, uh, you you probably been mentally checked out. And so I really appreciate you checking back in and joining us for this. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you.